with Bill Bodke exploring the origin and evolution of the Mars Trojans. Okay, so this is, so this project uh, was just something kind of fun I decided to do, and it actually turned out to be more fun than I anticipated. This was, I, what I wanted to understand is more about Mars Trojans, which I've been curious about for a long time. But, and what I think I found is that I could say some interesting things about Mars Trojans, but also about how Mars Trojans relate to the origin of Mars, to planet formation. We can set some interesting constraints, even though these, there aren't many of these guys. So let's uh, jump right in. And to talk about Trojans, it's helpful if you know what a Trojan is. So, but I thought I'd start off with the most famous population of Trojans, and that namely, those are Jupiter's Trojans. Okay, so NASA's recently selected a mission to go visit the Trojans called Lucy. It's being led by Hal Levison, you know, and so it will be to NASA, but okay, it'll, it'll work out okay. Um, so what Trojans are is if you, if here's a population you have that's about 60 degrees before Jupiter, about 60 degrees after Jupiter, if these are basically dynamical regions where the gravitational uh, uh, attraction of the Sun and Jupiter are comparable. So you get a, essentially a stable region and you can have objects there if they manage to get in. And Jupiter has on the order of maybe a tenth to a third of the asteroid belt's population in each of these, uh, in each of these uh, locations. So we call these the L4 and L5 Lagrange points. And what's interesting about Trojans in particular for Jupiter is that they tend to have very high inclinations. Some of them go up to inclinations of almost 40 degrees. And so it's very difficult to see a scenario about how you would get these objects if you just had things like gas drag and the rest. Gas drag would be very good at making low inclination guys, but not high inclination ones. So how to get Trojans has always been a big mystery. Okay, and so as, the, as of the Asteroids 3 book, we didn't have a good solution for this. Okay, and that was back in about 2002 or so. So then what happened is uh, this new model came along called the Nice model. And the Nice model describes a dynamical construct where the giant planets form in a different location than we see them today. Jupiter forms about the same place, but the rest of the giant planets form about half the distance from the sun than they currently are. And they're surrounded by a large disk of comets, maybe about 20 Earth masses. This system eventually goes unstable. And one of the reasons we like this model is that when the planets stop migrating and they deplete this disk, they actually do a pretty good job of reproducing the orbits of the giant planets in semi-major axis and inclination of centricity. That doesn't mean the model's right, okay, but it does suggest that it's, it's, it has a certain power to it. And at the moment, it's the best model we have to reproduce these orbits. So the question is, how, can, how far can we push this model until it breaks? And that's what we're trying to do. So in, in that line, uh, after this model came out, David Nisforni had a really interesting idea. And he said, well, what we know about the Nice model is that giant planets can have encounters with one another. So imagine this is your Jupiter flying around, and this is your, you know, maybe a Neptune flying around. And at the same time it's flying around, you have all sorts of comets that are flying around the same place. If you can have these objects encounter one another, they can get a three-body reaction. And in some cases, you can get things trapped. So this is actually how we might think we get the irregular satellites we have around the giant planets. But the same process of having two objects encounter one another causes a little jump. And you if you happen to have objects sitting, sort of minding their own business, and all of a sudden the planet jumps a Lagrange point on top of you, you're trapped, right? So this is how we think we might get Trojans. And indeed, they recently wrote a paper in 2013 on this very issue. The dots are the observed Trojans we can see in libration amplitude and inclination and eccentricity. The, sim the large symbols are what they get from different model simulations. And you can see that the fit's rather good. Okay, so they actually do a pretty good job of getting us Jupiter's Trojans. And the big thing is this model is giving us high inclination Trojans, oops, high inclination Trojans, which is what we want. Okay, so with this sort of idea in mind, let's now think about Mars a little bit. Okay. So we want to think about how Mars uh, objects could be created. But to tell you that, I first have to tell you a little bit about Mars Trojans, okay? So, so Mars Trojans are really interesting, but they're a much, much smaller population than the Jupiter Trojans. So if we go, for example, to the, the L4 Lagrange point, we have one object that's been identified there, and it, that size of it is only two kilometers. So it's a really small guy, okay? And we think it's a, it's a C-type, that means it's probably somewhat alike to a carbonaceous chondrite. There's also the L5 position. Here we have a few more objects. And interestingly enough, most of these objects seem to be in an asteroid family. So that means that there was probably a disruption of an object and it created a lot of fragments. These fragments tend to be A-type, which suggests that they're very olivine rich. That could mean they're from the mantle of a big object, but that there will also have meteorites that are very olivine rich that don't look like they were a part of a mantle. So they could, could just be an olivine rich type of asteroid or so. But regardless, we have this family and when you take all these pieces and put them back together, you also get a body that's about two kilometers. So effectively, we have one two kilometer object there and effectively one two kilometer object there. But the issue is these guys also have high inclinations. So they probably weren't formed again by gas drag or anything else. We need some other mechanism. So if we use the analogy we had before where giant plants were encountering one another, does that work for Mars? 
Okay? Well, the one time Mars may have had a lot of big things throwing it around was back during planet formation. So here's a, a quick simulation uh, put together by uh, Levison et al. So what we have here is this image or axis. Here we have a whole bunch of small objects that are growing into uh, ultimately the terrestrial planets. So here's mass and Earth masses over here. So here's your Venus and here's your Earth. And so Mars is around here. But in the process of Mars uh, growing, it's getting thrown around. And so if you have planetesimals in the right place and time, you can actually get Mars Trojans from this. And in a recent paper that actually just came out like you know, a couple days ago by uh, Poloshuk, they claim that the capture probability for a population that started very on orbits very similar to Mars and then they let them evolve, the capture probability for this is on the order of minus 10 to minus 4 to 10 to minus 5 or so. So you don't need a lot of objects, relatively speaking, to get some Mars Trojans. Maybe, you know, 10,000 to 100,000 bodies may be enough. Okay. So, but this raises some really interesting questions about essentially planet formation in a sense. So we have Mars over here, but we know of a whole bunch of small bodies that now have a direct association with Mars. We have Phobos and Deimos. Phobos is about 22 kilometers, Deimos is 11. And somehow they managed to survive early solar system bombardment and whatever was going on. And then we have the Mars Trojans, they're about two kilometers. So the question is, how did these guys survive, and how did sort of these guys survive amid all the other things that were happening early in the solar system? So one possibility is that these guys formed really late. Maybe they formed, but there just weren't many things to batter them, and so they, they managed to survive. Or maybe they were all really lucky, and you know, who knows? I mean, how do you quantify luck? But the big problem here is that we don't understand enough about planet formation to really say, well, this is the population that was hitting at a given time. You know, our models just aren't quite good enough for that. But there is something we do know, okay? And that is that because all these link worlds are linked to Mars, if we can really understand the Mars bombardment history uh, well, we can take whatever bombardment population we have there, and we can sort of scale it to these objects, and we can see how they relate. So I can tell you these objects, let's say, are consistent with, for, with having a bombardment history of half of Mars, or all of Mars, or maybe more than Mars. I can tell you that much, and then we can go from there. Okay. So I need to talk, tell you a little bit about the bombardment history of Mars to tell you the story of these guys. Okay. So, so on Mars, one of the first things we know is that the biggest feature we can see on Mars with our eyes is called the global dichotomy. Okay. It was, we think this, this is a, a large topographic difference we have between the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere of several kilometers. Um, we think, although our people argue about this, but we think it was probably produced by a large object hitting Mars, probably on the order of at least a series size or larger. That created a large impact basin, and that seems consistent with the modeling work and a lot of the evidence for this. And in fact, this impact may have even created Phobos and Deimos, and Robin Knopp is going to talk about that possibility uh, tomorrow, I think in some session, whenever that is. Okay. So if we, if we sort of use that, we can then look at the craters we have on Mars. So this is from some recent geologic mapping work by Ken Tanaka and all the, all the fine people at, the, at, uh, at, the, at uh, the USGS. And so what we find is that if you look at the northern hemisphere of Mars, we don't have many craters. They're probably there, but they're probably buried under kilometers of sediment. So the only really big crater that stands out is Utopia, and we can see that really well in gravity. But if you go to the southern hemisphere, we have on the order of about 100 craters, larger than about 150 kilometers. Okay? And if we scale that to the entire surface, so these take up maybe about 40 to 50% of Mars, and you scale them the entire surface, you get a plot that kind of looks like this down here. Okay? And then you can combine that with some of the oldest crater terrains on Mars, and you can scale them the same way. And we get these red curves sort of represent, that's the oldest crater history we can see on Mars. Okay? And so what I wanted to do is see, okay, what population could give us that? Well, something that we've found been doing recently with the Nice model is seeing how it destabilizes the asteroid belt. And so we've been taking the asteroid belt, and we let it get, you know, all affected by the Nice model, and then we see what escapes, and we see how much hits Mars. So in the most recent model we have, this is from David Nisforni in 2007, and I'm on this paper, what we have is we find the asteroid belt lost about 8,000 objects, give or take a factor or two, and the, and the number of objects lost were about, you know, larger than about 10 kilometers. So if you take that to scale things, and then you take the size distribution we have in the inner main belt. So here's the main belt size distribution, and you can see it's kind of shallow down to about maybe 20 kilometers or so, and then it goes steep. If you take that and you apply those numbers to Mars, and assume about half a percent hits Mars, you actually do a remarkably good job of explaining what we see. Okay, so that tells us you know, either we're really lucky, or there's something to this, and Mars has been hit by a main belt population, which is consistent with the modeling we've done. So that's kind of neat. Okay? So we can take that population now, and we can scale it to different worlds. So if we take that population and scale it to Phobos and Deimos, though that's not enough impactors to actually disrupt Phobos or disrupt Deimos, but we can look at the largest impacts we have. So the largest crater we have on, on Phobos is the nine kilometer Stickney crater. Okay, that's this, you know, the big famous one here or so. 
And then on Deimos, it's a little uncertain what the largest crater is because we don't have fantastic imagery. But when I've talked to some of the experts on this. They claim that, you know, there's maybe one or two craters that are close to maybe 2.3 or 2.5 kilometers. And that may change in the future, but that's sort of what we have right now. So if I take this impactor population we have on Mars and scale it, what I find is that depending on the scaling relationship you use, I should get uh, the number of Stickney producing impacts that hit Phobos should be on the order of one. It's somewhere between about 0.2 and about 1.3. So that's about what you want. Okay? And for Deimos, interestingly enough, it's about the same. I'm getting between about 0.7 and 3. And again, if there's one or two of those uh, large craters there, that seems pretty consistent. So what this would say is that the oldest cratered terrains on Mars are consistent with the impact crater we have on Phobos and Deimos. And so that means you can make an argument they're all sort of comparable in time. So if you want Phobos and Deimos to be formed by the Borealis impact, that makes sense by this. Okay. Okay, so we can play the same game with the Mars Trojans. Okay, so we, basically I'm not going to go through all the scaling because it gets you know, boring and the rest, and I don't have, only have so much time. But basically we played the same game, and what we found is that the probability of disrupting a two-kilometer body here by, um, by a population, that the same population that's hitting Mars, that, that the odds of that are about 50%. So right now we have one object that's intact, and we have one object that has a family. Okay, and so if you have a 50% disruption probability, that's about right. You know, one, you know, 50, one lives and one dies, right? Now, this is really statistics of small numbers, so it's hard to say much on that. But these numbers easily could have been a factor of 10 or 100 either way, and we don't see that. So that suggests maybe there's something to it. So at the very least, you might say that Mars Trojans are possibly close in age to Borealis as well. At least that seems consistent with everything we see. Okay, so just to sort of uh, tie things together. So here's what we have for a history of Mars. So Mars forms at some point. It's getting hit by early objects in some fashion. Then Borealis hits. And then it's getting a late bombardment population. And if our model is right, this is mostly coming from the asteroid belt. So I think what we can say now is that at least their impact histories on these objects are consistent with an impact history that starts about the time the Borealis hits. You know, we can't, they could be a little, bef a little bit after, a little before, and the rest, but it's comparable to that time. But we also know it's because we have to make Mars Trojans. We know that it, Mars at this time, when Borealis was happening, still had to be getting embryos shaking it around. Okay, so that really puts it back in the planet formation era. And so that suggests we're probably dealing with a time scale of maybe around four and a half billion years. And that seems to be very consistent with what we have for the meteorite evidence we have that Borealis may have formed around four and a half billion years as well. Okay. So what this means, though, is that at about four and a half billion years ago, since we can explain the impact record on Mars pretty well from our model, there couldn't have been a lot of leftover planetesimals at that time. They had to be pretty limited. And I got one last slide. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going, I'm going. Okay. So, so but there's some other interesting things we can think about. So imagine the Mars Trojans were made before this time, because they could be. There were big impacts on Mars, and maybe they were made at this time. But then somehow they have to survive lots of bombardment that existed that time. Okay, because we're not seeing, like, we're not seeing two decimated families and the rest. So what this means is that either the population of leftover planetesimals here was really small, um, or, you know, something else is going on. You know, either they formed here, or if they formed here, we have to, can't have a lot of leftover planetesimals because they wouldn't survive. The other possibility, and this was recently raised in this paper that came up by uh, Poloshuk this week, is that maybe Borealis, when it created all this ejected material, maybe some of that ejected material became Mars Trojans. So Mars Trojans is basically ejected from Mars, and our work would suggest that we're consistent with that. That, that could be true. We don't know it's true, but it's certainly no, no problem with this. But again, this suggests, again, there simply could not have been many leftover planetesimals, or this model just wouldn't make any sense. And so I'm going to stop there. So thanks. We do have a couple of minutes for questions. Dan Britt, UCF. When you talk about encounters between giant planets, uh, you're, how close do they have to get to have encounters? What do you mean by that? By, they don't have to be terribly close. They have what? to be able to gravitationally perturb one another. But for example, you're not going to do damage, dynamical damage to the satellites that exist. So if you had a, you know, like let's say Callisto or you had a Ganymede and the rest, their orbits would not be perturbed by these kicks. So they can so be somewhat distant. We're talking half AAU, tenth an AU, AAU? Yeah, I don't remember the number off the top of my head. It, it could be that order. I, okay. I just don't remember. It's, it's far, oh, oh uh, Carly. Fascinating, Bill. Um, I'm, I'm, can you say something more about the tr Mars Trojans relative to their spectral type? Because yeah. they don't look anything like Phobos and Deimos, 
So what does that imply? Does that mean, does that require different origins? Well, the person who could really answer that question is giving the talk opposite to me in the other room. That's Andy Rivkin. <laughs> um, in this Polishuk paper, they did some additional spectral work, and they claim that they all look like A-type asteroids. And so they say that's olivine rich, but you're right, they don't look like Phobos and Deimos. Yeah, I haven't looked at this. Yeah. In, in the paper, they claim, they, what they say is that if, you, if you're blasting off a huge region of Mars, it could be you could have some diversity in that. So having some things be maybe primitive and some things be olivine rich, maybe that's okay. I, I, I don't think I, I know enough to be able to say whether that's valid or not. I think it's, I mean, I, I find a, a valid, a, another hypothesis that I think could be easily work as well is that you'd kind of expect a lot of, let's say, you know, olivine rich primitive meteorites and the rest might be something that just happens to live in the terrestrial planet region. And so capturing terrestrial, ca capturing objects of that nature maybe isn't a huge surprise. So either one of those answers I think is valid. I think it's hard to say more than that. All right, thank you, Bill. Thanks. I'm going to move up.